This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com. And today, as my special guest, we have the former Kato, Max Moon. He wrestled for Bad Company, <laughs> Orient Express. Uh, his real name is Paul Diamond, or his, re- his, his best wrestling name is Paul Diamond. That's not actually your real there name. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> what is your real name? It's uh, Tom Boric. Okay. Yeah. And you're Croatian, I, right? I am Croatian, yes. Born and uh, grew up there till I was 13 and then uh, moved to Canada and finished high school there and uh, went to college in Virginia on a soccer scholarship, played some pro soccer for a few years. And when that ended, uh, I didn't want a real job, so uh, turned to wrestling. Met one of the Malenkos, actually, at a Gold's Gym in Tampa and uh, – Boris Malenko, the dad was still alive at the time. He's the one that uh, is mostly responsible for training me. Did you have interest in pro wrestling while you were still a soccer player? I did. You know what? Uh, so um, I, from Croatia, I wound up in Winnipeg, which at that time, uh, you know, you had AWA, Burns uh, organization, uh, would be on TV. And I started watching it and uh, – Kind of got interested, went to a couple of live shows at the Winnipeg Arena. And, uh, you know, it it seemed interesting. It seemed like, uh, you know, as long as you were a good athlete that, uh, you know, you had to be able to do well. So once the uh, North American Soccer League uh, folded back in 1984, uh, like I said, uh, I mean, I don't know. For me, I just wanted to make a living in sports of some kind. And actually, you know, soccer was my everything, as you know, Europe, uh, you know, uh, most of the world that actually it's growing in the United States now as well. Uh, soccer is the biggest sport there is. And that's what I wanted to do. My father played back in, in the day and uh, you know, but that came to an end that there was no other place to go other than to go back to Europe. And I didn't want to do that. So uh I just thought, uh, let me give uh, wrestling a try. Now, the Malenkos were known for being shooters a little bit as well. Did they stretch you much when you were learning to train? No, not at all. You know, uh, at that point, I think it already kind of was getting to where it was easier to get into professional wrestling. I mean, I've heard a lot of stories, uh, you know, prior to that, years before, where guys wanted to get in. And they would get the, the heck beat out of them and stretched. Uh, you know, there was uh, my former partner, Pat Tanaka. He was trained by Hiro Matsuda, which, you know, uh, Florida Championship Wrestling. And, man, they, they beat the heck out of Pat. They sent him to Japan where they uh, broke his leg and, you know, all kind of stuff. So, no, that never happened. I think, you know, uh, Boris was, uh, Malenko was just interested in, in, in giving somebody an opportunity and, well, he was having to make a living too. So if he beat the hack out of you and you didn't come to his school, then he's losing out. So that's kind of what I felt was going on. And I'm very, very fortunate and lucky uh, to have had those guys. You know, to me, I mean, I don't know. I didn't attend any other wrestling schools. But to me, uh, I would say it, it is and it was one of the best. Did you ever see that video that came out in recent years with Plan B? where Boris kind of exposed the business probably before you ever met him. And what was your reaction when you saw it? Uh, I did see it. I actually listened to it. Uh, You know, there was a few guys, I think Orton and Bob Roop and a few other guys, they were trying to, uh, I think, you know, well, they tried to start their own company, which I guess didn't work out. And uh, you know, they felt like they were being shortchanged. Uh, I really, didn't know what to think of it. And, you know, at that point where I saw it really didn't understand the business that much. So, but I was surprised, you know, um, it it seems like it didn't really affect much uh, after that. Although uh, I have to say, you know, when I started training with, with Malenko, uh, I was told by other people that were in the business that uh, I was never going to get anywhere and be blackballed because Malenko trained me and stuff. And, you know, uh, that just wasn't the case. In fact, he was responsible for me getting my first job, which was uh, uh, NWA uh, back on TBS in uh, 1985. What was that experience like? You know what? Uh, it was 
quite interesting. I mean, I was, you know, very inexperienced. Uh, uh, Ole Anderson at that time owned the company and, and, you know, he ran the show and stuff. So I was just green and, and just wanting to learn. And uh, I got an opportunity to, you know, to work on the road, which uh, was great for me. Uh, again, you know, not really knowing what the business was about at that time. I just really was, was happy to have been able to get a job and didn't have to, you know, work the independent shows with 20 people in the audience. Although, you know, at that point when you start, you really don't care. You just want to learn. How did the NWA wrestlers that were more established treat you? Uh, there was no problem, actually. Uh, you know what? And one of the guys I have to really uh, be grateful to uh, was Ronnie Garvin. And I think actually Ronnie Garvin was a part of that. The, men, the thing you mentioned about the, the exposed, uh, the ex expose that they did. And uh, so, uh, they told him, you know, that I was coming and stuff and I, I would ride, Ronnie would take me to, you know, I'd ride with him to the shows and stuff and uh, kind of uh, learn from him as well. He was a great guy, but no, no, nobody had any problem. I mean, just another guy coming in, you know, that got a job and, you know, the wrestling business is not so much always uh, how much, you know, but who, you know, so that's how the guys would usually get in. Who would have been the biggest star you worked with in those early days? Uh, I didn't really work with any any stars um, unless I was getting squashed on TV. Uh, and, uh, you know, so um, it was shortly after I got hired, uh, Ole uh, sold out to uh, Jim Crockett. So, you know, here I am. I had been there, I think, for a couple of months. Uh, I was living in Tampa at the time. Of course, they were in Atlanta. I went home for a few days. I came back for the TV taping and uh, man, there's a hundred guys and Jimmy Crockett took over and like, it's like, what's going on? And at that point, you know, they just kind of used me as uh, just to put people over on TV. So I worked like with Barbarian on TV and uh, trying to think who else. Uh, I didn't last very long. They, you know, they, they gave me a, I worked a couple more months uh, and uh, they, they had so many guys to do what I was doing and to add the knowledge that, you know, like I said, being that green. So I was let go uh, maybe a couple of months afterwards. And I wound up in uh, San Antonio the first time uh, for uh, Texas all-star wrestling. Yes, and you had a little bit of a push there as a tag team wrestler, I think, with Nick Kanitsky first. How was that? Well, actually, uh, to correct, so that my first partner was uh, Frankie the Thumper Lancaster. Ever heard of him? No, I have not heard of him, no. <laughs> okay, well, I think he, he, he left uh, San Antonio after a short while, and I think he went to work for Bill Watts. Uh, you know, whatever. But yeah, then then uh, uh, my next tag team partner was Nick Kaniski. Uh, he was greener than me. <laughs> and uh, it just uh, didn't work out real well. So they were really trying to, you know, create like another Rock and Roll Express or the Fantastics or whatever. Uh, and at that time, uh, Sean Michaels had just started wrestling. His first uh, territory was uh, Bill Watts in Louisiana, and he had came back home. And, you know, as far as I know, he had always wanted to be a singles wrestler, and, you know, obviously that's how it turned out. But at that time, uh, after Nick Kaniski and I didn't really work out and didn't do as well as they would have liked, uh, Sean Michaels became my uh, tag team partner. We were known as the American Force. How was Shawn Michaels in those days? I know you had a long uh, friendship with him throughout the years, but how was he in those early years? Um, I mean, you know what? It was really good because we both were uh, wanting to learn. And, and so we rode together to the shows and, and obviously back home. And we just wouldn't stop talking about the, uh, you know, what we did wrong, what we could do better, uh, what we did right. Uh, and, you know, Sean, a great athlete, and he, he had a 
ton of different moves. And, uh, you know, I, I learned from him, although uh, a, a funny little story, if I can tell you. So uh, I, at the time, we were already a tag team and uh, we had a show in Odessa, Texas. And uh, I think it was a six man tag. Uh, and Sean somehow finishes, got messed up. Sean wound up pinning everybody. And so at that time, uh, the guy that was the booker in San Antonio was this guy, Al Madrill. So they said, well, you know, since this happened, we're going to give Paul a singles match. And, you know, I had been learning stuff from Sean, different moves and things. So when I had my singles match on TV, I used some of those moves. And, you know, I thought, wow, great. You know, I got some new stuff and we're a tag team. We can look like, you know, we can do what the other guy can do. And so the next day that I saw Sean, man, he was pissed off. You're trying to be Sean Michaels. You try it. You need to be Paul Diamond, you know? I, and yeah, so that was, that was kind of interesting. I'm like, really didn't understand where that was coming from, but that's kind of the way Sean was. So we already had a bit of an attitude even back then. Absolutely. And he had been in the business for maybe a year. Now, I understand you also had some contact with Chris Adams in those days. How was he? Uh, not really sure where that story came from. However, untrue. Okay. Well, good, good that <laughs> you cleared that up. It's on the internet. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't, you know, man, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. I, I think I worked with Chris Adams once in San Antonio, just a, a, a match on, on a card, but that's it. Apparently he helped add to your wrestling skill repertoire. <laughs> Somehow must have been. I'm not really sure. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, he, he had not really nothing to do with my career. So you, you soon after went to Continental Wrestling in Memphis where you were working for Jerry Lawler and Jerry Jarrett. How was that experience for you? That was an invaluable experience. You know, I mean, I had spent uh, almost, I don't know, two, two and a half years there. And uh, I learned so much. Uh, you know, they were always very, very creative in, in, in the angles that they did and the storylines they told and also uh, building, uh, you know, uh, the wrestlers, they would, you know, they, they couldn't afford to, to pay the big stars. So they would bring in guys that didn't have that much experience, but would create something out of them. And so, but yeah, I mean, and as far as, like I said, you know, just working uh, different angles and different storylines and being involved in different types of matches, the chain matches and dog collar matches and, uh, you know, everything. I mean, that's how Memphis was very, very creative. Uh, in fact, another funny fact, uh, one night in Nashville, they had a match with a stipulation, loser eats x lax cake. <laughs> I hope that was kayfabe. Uh, I would believe so. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, it, it, it was a good place, you know. And actually, uh, at that time, uh, Jeff Jarrett had just started. He, he was uh, refereeing while he was still in high school and, and, you know, ring crew and all that. And as soon as he graduated from high school was shortly after I got there. And I got a chance to work with Jeff from pretty much day one. And, you know, he was involved in the tag team scene at the time he was just you know very young and learning and uh that was really cool we had some uh, great matches and you know uh, i got to uh get to know jeff real well was he the partier that he has the reputation for already in those days or did that you know what i no not at all i mean he was just a young kid at the time and and uh you know i i was really shocked when i found out uh, what had happened with him uh, as he got older. So I would have never imagined uh, that uh, Jeff would have been a partier at all. And what was your opinion of Jerry Jarrett? A lot of people say he was cheap and everything, but he has the reputation of being a great mind. Well, yeah, for sure. He, he was a great mind. That's what, you know, that's where all these uh, uh, different, uh, things came from like the, the fabulous ones. Right. And like 
Tennessee, they were like the first ones to do uh, vignettes with guys and, and, you know, pictures and uh, just different things to make their wrestlers look like much bigger stars than they really were. And, you know, I remember because we, you know, we wrestled a lot of small towns. Uh, Tennessee basically was a, a weekly territory which had Memphis Monday night, uh, Louisville, Kentucky Tuesday, Evansville, Indiana Wednesday, then Thursday, Friday, they'd have a spot show, whether it was, you know, some small town in Tennessee or Kentucky or Arkansas. And when you came to those small towns, that's all the TV wrestling that they, those people saw. And when they put up the posters, they put on there TV wrestling stars coming here and, you know, doing, like I said, doing the vignettes and making the guys look bigger than they actually were. Uh, it, it, it drew pretty well and uh, there created a bigger interest than if you didn't do that. So yeah, Jerry Jarrett was very creative as well as Jerry Lawler. They kind of uh, split the booking, you know, so, uh, Jerry Jarrett would book for a few months and then when he'd kind of run dry or whatever, and things were going as well, Jerry Lawler would take over. So both of those guys learned a lot from them. Uh, I really admire Jerry Lawler's work. What a great mind. Would you expect Jerry Lawler still to be wrestling now? I don't know how old he is, but he's got to be approaching 70. Yeah, I think he's, yeah, 71 or two or something. Would I be, I, I wouldn't expect anybody to be, I, you know, I just turned 61 myself and man, I, I couldn't imagine getting the ring. But uh, what I can say is the way that Jerry Lawler always wrestled, which was, uh, you know, he, he uh, again, great mind in the ring, never took a whole lot of bumps. He worked like a guy that was, you know, like a Hulk Hogan, six foot eight, 300 pounds. And uh, he didn't, uh, you know, take all these crazy bumps that uh, we took as, you know, smaller guys, which, you know, he's no bigger, but just the way he worked. So if he's doing the same thing that he was doing back then, he could probably wrestle till, till he's 95. Yeah, and he's 72. I just looked it up as you okay, were, yeah, you were right, talking. Yeah, right. so, yeah. so everyone freaking out that Ric Flair is coming back at 73. Well, Jerry <laughs> Lawler is only a year younger. Yeah, but Jerry Lawler uh, hasn't done the uh, – slam off the top and uh, the upside down thing in a turnbuckle and uh, all that stuff. I don't think he's ever done that. Uh, his back barely uh, touched the mat in all the matches that he's had. Yeah, that's very true. Now, I guess you started teaming with Pat, Pat Tanaka in the Memphis territory as bad company. How did you guys start teaming together? Was that you coming up with the idea or was it given to you? And how did you come up with the name? Uh, yeah, no, they, so when I, when I came uh, to Tennessee, it was after the, at the San Antonio run uh, in 1986. And uh, I came in as, as a baby face and, you know, things were kind of, it was a slow start for me. And then it got to a point where they really didn't have a whole lot for me. Pat had arrived uh, a short while after uh, and he got involved well, he, they actually tagged him. He was uh, uh, tag team partners of Jeff Jarrett's at first. And then uh, it was Jerry Jarrett's whole idea, uh, you know, to turn me heel. And actually the whole angle was that eventually, uh, and, and uh, Jeff uh, was tagging, I believe, where it was, uh, uh, what was it? Oh, Billy Travis. And... Uh, you know, they lost a the match and Billy Travis had to leave town. And then Billy Travis came back under a hood and uh, somehow it wound up being that whoever, I mean, if, if you prove that it was Billy Travis, you got like $5,000 or something anyway. So I wind up turning heel. I take the mask off of Billy Travis and then everybody wants to kick my ass because this happened. So we had actually a, a three way. And uh, at that point we still weren't a tag team, but then, you know, after the three-way, we beat up Jeff, and uh, then Billy Travis came out, and uh, this is where our tag team kind of started. I don't think at that point they really thought that, you know, it would last or that we would click. Well, nobody really knew, but uh, yeah, things worked out real well. 
Uh, I don't think the bad company name probably came a little bit later on. Uh, and, you know, uh, downtown Bruno was our manager uh, at the time. We actually, Paul Heyman had just uh, gotten there to Tennessee and, you know, we had talked to Paul and stuff and we wanted Paul to be our manager, but uh, they didn't agree with that. They gave us downtown Bruno. And uh, as far as the name, like I said, I'm not really sure uh, where that came from. Uh, but it, it was, you know, a, a while at, once we started working together and, and things starting to click, you know, we realized that probably we would be a lot better together than we were you know, as a single, especially because, you know, we weren't huge guys, especially Pat, and uh, we were doing well as a tag team. And for yeah, any right. fans that don't know, downtown Bruno is Harvey Whippleman. Right. Yes. Yeah. Now, I'll just skip ahead for one second because a fan here tipped $5 to me to know what was it like when you wrestled The Undertaker? Oh man, um, it was easy, you know, it, uh, obviously not much of a match. Undertaker had just, he arrived in the WWF at the time, uh, a short while after I had gotten there. So, you know, they were trying to get him over. Uh, he, he was just, it was basically about the gimmick and having Paul Bear in the urn and all that. And then he just, uh, you know, did a few moves and uh, I got tombstone. Were you uh, surprised that he's gone on to have this 30-year career and is thought of as one of the best of all time? Yes, uh, definitely. And in my mind, I mean, well, you know, I have my best of all time and Undertaker wouldn't be on that list. I think uh, maybe the, the Undertaker gimmick might be one of the best of all time, but as far as a worker, you know, he was good, but but not... not uh, would I consider, you know, best of all time. Was he nice backstage? Oh yeah, no, he was a great guy. Yeah, no, no problem. And I, you know, uh, again, you know, it was early on as he just arrived there. So uh, I'm not sure, you know, he was there, like you said, 30 years. So I, I don't know what he turned out to be uh, like later on, but from what I heard, you know, he was always very supportive, uh, you know, in the dressing room to everybody and, uh, was one of those guys that everybody respected and, and, uh, you know, he just wouldn't, uh, uh, accept any kind of shit from anybody. So, uh, if anything went wrong as far as Vince or whatever, I think, you know, he would approach them and try and uh, get it corrected. Yeah. He was known as being the locker room leader for several decades. Right. When you were back there. Or did anybody have a position like that? Uh, You know what? I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm trying to think. Uh, no, not not at that time. I mean, you know, Hogan obviously had a lot of a lot of you know power and stuff. And and you know, Hogan was always he was a good guy to me, and he, he tried to help me. Uh, but I, I don't know how much you know. He was probably more so for himself than than a, a locker room leader. And I can't really think of uh, anyone else at the time that uh, would have fit that. I think in your day too, there was more veterans that had had success in a lot of territories and there was a lot more uh, egos than there, there were when Undertaker was on top. There was less guys overall that had been stars in other places. Oh yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you know, I mean, just, you know, the, the tag teams, all the guys, well, you know, what happened, obviously, it was it was a few years after Vince kind of took over the wrestling world and he just collected all the stars from all the regional uh, territories. So, um, you know, all these guys had been on top in other places and, you know, everybody thought they should be on top still. And yet, you know, that wasn't the case. But yeah, I mean, you know, uh, Bushwhackers, uh, Legion of Doom. You know, they created Demolition. Those guys that, you know, worked in other places, uh, you know, being main eventers. Bret Hart and Jim Neidhart. I mean, you know, so. And, and you know, the singles guys as well, obviously. That, you know, Ted DiBiase and Jake the Snake and Ricky Steamboat. And, I mean, all those guys, 
you know, were a big deal uh, somewhere else, but it just, there's no way, there's just not enough room to, you know, have all those guys be on top. Somebody had to, uh, you know, do other positions. So, yeah, it definitely was that way. It was different, I'm sure, than, uh, you know, as uh, time uh, went on and uh, those guys were gone and, and you got new guys coming. I understand that you feuded with the Nasty Boys in Memphis. How were they to work with? Um, man, that, that that I was shocked. That really, you know, that turned out great. It did. Uh, they wound up, I, I couldn't believe, you know, obviously they've always been heels, but in, in Memphis, uh, when they first came in and, and we worked that uh, uh, angle with them, they were big baby faces. And I mean... You know, at that time, they were still pretty green. Uh, but uh, I can't really, you know, we, we had all kinds of, again, the, the, another thing about Tennessee, I have to go, you know, they created gimmick kind of matches and stipulations and stuff that would make it easier than to just, you know, work a regular match. Um, yeah. <laughs> Man, I, I, a lot of memories from Tennessee, if I can't, you know. So at one uh, point, they uh, had uh, the Wheel of Torture. Uh, so the first week, uh, they had uh, uh, Lawler's girlfriend uh, was Vanna Black, and they spun the wheel, and whatever it landed on, that's the stipulation you'd have for the match. Loser eats dog food. Loser gets shocked by a cattle prod. Loser gets painted yellow. Um, I mean, crazy stuff, right? And so the first we we worked the nasty boys, and, and the first week, and this was the most ridiculous thing. Uh, I don't know who thought it would be a good idea because they put all the heels over the first week, and then they had the next week uh, the same wheel of torture thing. You spun it again, and then. Uh, all the baby faces went over. Wow. That was quite interesting. But yeah, in, in our matches with the nasty boys, basically the first week uh, they had to eat dog food. And then the next week, Pat got painted yellow. Was it hard to get the paint off? Yeah, it was. They actually, I think Sags just poured the bucket of paint on Pat's head. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> And as far as the AWA, you're very well known for your run there. How did you end up going to the AWA? Was that through its connection with Memphis? Uh, it was not. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar. Uh, you know, Pat's father uh, was, I don't know, half owner, part, part owner, Duke, Duke Kiyomoka of Florida Championship Wrestling. He was with Eddie Graham. So... Any of the you know guys that, that whose families involved in the business, they're always kind of taking care of and making. Somebody always made sure that those guys would have a job. So at the time, uh, we had finished up in in Tennessee. Uh, there was a small organization starting out in Pensacola. We spent a couple of months there, and uh, at that time, Wahoo McDaniel was the booker for uh, Vern. AWA. And, uh, you know, uh, Pat knew uh, Wahoo from his dad and from Florida and different things. And so actually, uh, I have to get credit give credit where credit is due. And, you know, Pat called Wahoo and, and uh, he decided to bring us in. Before I ask you more about that, there's a fan that tipped me $10 and he said, you're a great worker. He loved your matches with Tanaka and he wants to know, what do you think about the death of tag team wrestling? Uh, it's sad. You know, I, I don't watch a whole lot of wrestling. I, I've been watching maybe a little bit more recently since the AWA got started. But, uh, man, it's it just, uh, I don't know. You know, what I see is just uh, if you got to be an acrobat or a gymnast and, and just doing all this stuff. There's no psychology uh none of that at all it, it, it's kind of sad uh, you know to to see the way that it's gone and i mean and not only like you know tag team wrestling i mean I, somebody's gonna get killed man i swear i saw somebody like dive off a ladder or something on AEW, and like where is it gonna stop 
I'm not really sure, but uh, I know if I know, you know, we, we did some uh, things along those lines early on, especially with the rockers and stuff. But, uh, you know, everybody's trying to go higher and further and more flips. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just really not sure uh, until somebody really gets hurt or, or dies in the ring. I don't know where it's going to stop. And uh, I don't know, the, you know, how the fans uh, see it. I mean, I mean, you just sit there and you watch a bunch of moves. There's no psychology. There's no story to the matches. And that's what I, I really am most disappointed about. The other thing about some of those gymnastic styles moves, it looks like they would have to be cooperating with each other to do them. It doesn't even look like it's something you would do to somebody if you were actually trying to hurt them. Right, right. Very, very true. And, you know, the other thing I just thought of as well is, I mean, when you do all those kind of moves and, you know, you somebody dives off a ladder and you go through a table and then in the next minute you're back on your feet and you're throwing them into the ropes and doing, you know, something else. No, you know, I know wrestling's entertainment and it's, you know, whatever they want to call it, it's not real. Well, you know, it, it is still hard work, but you at least want to try and create some sort of, I don't know, not credibility, I guess, at least for people to think that, that this move actually is hurting the other person. And, you know, these, where's the wrestling moves that, you know, usually when you started a match, you did uh, exchange some wrestling, chain wrestling and that kind of stuff. Now they start a match with 10 clotheslines. What's it all mean? Nothing. If I got to give you 10 clotheslines, you got to get up and you get up and you beat me up. What does it all mean? Yeah, I can tell that you're, you're not a regular viewer, as a lot of people aren't anymore. But as far as your AWA run, they gave you Diamond Dallas Page as your manager, and he's gone on to have a Hall of Fame career. What was mm -hmm. it like working with him? You know what? It was awesome. Uh, he, well, you know, the primary reason why – uh, they brought him in in the first place because, uh, you know, uh, Pat and I were never uh, real good uh, talkers, never good on the mic. And so we needed somebody to speak for us. And uh, I think, you know, he had just sent in uh, a video or something to the AWA and uh, they decided to bring him in. At that time, I don't think he even, you know, I, I don't think he had any thought of becoming a wrestler, but as he managed us and he was around, you know, he was ringside and watched the matches. I think he realized it's something that he wanted to do and he could do. Uh, actually, I think, you know, Dusty Rhodes was responsible for training Damodell's page. And of course you had your feud with the midnight rockers and the AWA that everyone remembers. Right. How was that? And how had Sean progressed by this time since Texas? You know, it's and the, the funny thing, right? Like I said, you know, Sean always wanted to be, you know, a singles wrestler, right? And so, uh, as I had mentioned, we were tag team partners in Texas. And then uh, the guy that trained him, uh, Jose Lothario, he was, uh, you know, a Mexican wrestler. Not sure if you're familiar, but that, that's who was responsible for training Sean. And he had connections. And so, Sean got a, a position in the AWA and he, you know, he left me, you know, whatever he wanted to be a singles wrestler and he arrives in the AWA and guess what happens? They give him Marty Jannetty. <laughs> so, you know, kind of didn't quite go like he had planned, but uh, you know, they, they, they did very well, but that's not what Sean wanted to do. Um, but uh, you know, as far as what you asked, sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent. Uh, they, uh, the, the Midnight Rockers, uh, at the time that we got to the AWA, uh, we were, you know, over good and stuff and they were the, the tag team champions, but I don't think they had been there that long, but as soon as we got there, the decision was made that they were going to drop the, the, the belts, uh, uh, to us and they were not very pleased. Uh, and, you know, basically at the time we would go to Las Vegas uh, to the showboat 
uh, casino and tape uh, four weeks, one month worth of uh, TV shows. So the first time we went, we had a match with them, uh, which was a non-title match and we beat them. And then the next time we went, they dropped the belts. And, you know, again, when that came up, I remember the, the meeting with the uh, uh, people in charge and uh, they were not happy. Uh, and I don't know that maybe they had a point, maybe, you know, we could have extended that and, and gone a lot longer with the angle. I don't, I think, you know, them dropping the belts to us at the time, uh, sort of, uh, yeah, made them leave earlier than they may have stayed a little bit longer. And then, you know, once they dropped the belts, they saw, you know, this is not going to work. And they went and tried to get in contact with Vince again and, you know, wound up hiring, getting hired back over there. Jeff would That's like to know how was your pay in the AWA days? <laughs> um, not great. Uh, and you know what, at the time that I, that we arrived there, uh, was 1988 AWA basically had lost all their talent, uh, and not having talent. They lost a bunch of big, uh, arenas and towns that they used to run regularly. So not only was the pay, uh, not great, uh, they were not running that many shows. So it, it was really kind of a struggle. You know, uh, they were really struggling to book towns just because, you know, all the stars. I mean, at one time, you know, uh, they had everybody, right? Uh, Bobby Heenan, Jesse Devotty, uh, Hulk Hogan. I mean, you name it. Rick Martel, uh, you know, Nick Bockwink. I mean, you know, everybody was there and, 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 Vern killed it all because, well, he, you know, I guess one of the things was he wouldn't put the belt on Hogan. Uh, and I'm not sure how that would have turned out, even if he had. And uh, as far as, you know, uh, I, what I heard recently anyway, is that, you know, the problem was uh, the split of the uh, royalty money, the gimmick money, the pictures and whatever Hulk was selling, you know, Vern just wouldn't give in. So I'm not really sure. But yeah, so, uh, you know, they, they just, it was, the, the pay wasn't that great. And, uh, and I, I understand that it probably didn't have uh, much to give, or they, I'm sure they could have always given a little bit more, but uh, it, it was a struggle just because we didn't work uh, regularly or, you know, uh, that much uh, in a month. Michael Collins wants to know if you thought Vern seemed out of touch in the 80s and if you saw signs of the business already passed him by. I guess you kind of already answered that partly. Yeah, and, and I, I can add to that for sure. Just a, a quick story, you know. Um, uh, Vern considers himself, uh, considered himself to be a, a big star. And, you know, at that time, WWF had already taken over and, you know, they were given people uh, competitive matches uh, on, on uh, television, whereas Vern still stuck with his formula of just having squash matches uh, on TV. And so we were sitting in a, in a meeting and, and Vern was there. And I remember, you know, uh, telling Vern, I, you know, why, why can't we beat up somebody that matters? Well, I matter. You can beat me up. Hey, I am the star around here. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So, yeah, that kind of told you all you needed to know. But, uh, yeah, no, for sure. You know, he just uh, – he didn't see it like uh, that the business had moved on and he just hadn't changed. Towards the end of your AWA run, you teamed with Dale Wilkes, who passed away this year. Any yeah. memories about him? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you Our know, last Matt Dale, story here uh, was uh, 2021 that he died. Right, right. I saw that. Uh, man, rest in peace, Dale. Uh, he was a great guy. Uh, I remember him from you know, he uh, trained at uh, Brad Rangan's uh, wrestling school in Minneapolis there. So, uh, you know, know him from back then when he was still training. And uh, was a great athlete uh, and, you know, uh, 
as the, the bad company split up and stuff, uh, I thought uh, Dell and I, it worked out real well. Uh, I really wasn't looking at the time, you know, to perhaps, you know, have another tag team partner that was going to, uh, or I was going to stay uh, as a tag team for a long time. Uh, it was just kind of a, a, a time space filler. Uh, I was, you know, getting ready to leave her. And so they just needed somebody uh, to uh, uh, fight for the uh, AWA tag titles. But I, I loved working with uh, Dell. Again, you know, we always got along. Great guy, uh, great athlete. Uh, and I'm just sad uh, to, uh, you know, see him gone way too soon. I think that uh, you and Pat lost the titles in the AWA at one point to Ken Patira and Brad Reagans, who you just mentioned. Yes. Uh, Ken is a hilarious guy who I've interviewed, I think, three times. What okay. would you like to work with? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't, you know what, we only worked with him a couple of times, but, uh, you know, he, he did his power stuff, his strongman stuff. Uh, and, and at that time, you know, things were really coming to an end and they needed uh, to put the belts on somebody else because, you know, we were out of there. So, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, wasn't, wouldn't have been my choice of a, a team to drop the belts to or to work with because it was just a different kind of style, but we did the best we could. And uh, I thought it worked out okay. And again, you know, we were out of there, so it didn't really matter. Did you go straight to the WWE after that, or was there independent time in between? Uh, there was uh, independent time, and there was actually, uh, I had considered, you know, even just getting out of the business altogether. In fact, uh, as I finished things up in, in uh, Minneapolis, uh, you know, Pat actually, again, you know, I'm sure I can't say I am sure hundred percent, but the, he got it. He, he was the original member of the Orient Express in the WWF with Sato. Uh, and I'm guessing, you know, again, his father, that connection had something to do with him getting the job. I, I can't say for sure, but that, that's what I'm guessing. And so he was there for a while. Uh, I actually decided to go back to school. I was going to do like computer repairs or stuff. And uh, I'd actually went for, or my first semester back. And, uh, you know, I said, I don't want to know anything that's going on in the business at this point. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to do it. I just want to finish this and then, uh, you know, perhaps go back to it. Well, uh, lo and behold, maybe uh, halfway through, I got a call from from the the WWF office, and they wanted me to you know come out and uh, uh, work some matches. They wanted to look at me, and of course, you know, uh, I just couldn't turn it down. And I thought, it, you know, okay, well, it, it's an opportunity, so I wound up going, and uh, you know, uh, things worked out at least for a while. What were the contracts like in those days? You always hear that it was for like ten days. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm glad that guys these days have contracts that actually have, I'm guessing they, they have a, a figure of what you're going to make weekly. And then if things are better, you do better. Well, back then, uh, there was no money uh, listed on the contract. WWF, their whole to fulfill their side of the contract, right? They had to give you 10 bookings in a year and pay you at least $150. So if they booked you 10 times and you got that money, now you were tied to them for the whole year and they could make your ass sit at home and do nothing, but you couldn't go and work anywhere else according to the contract. Also, if you sign a contract, I'm guessing, then you're working for that company. You're an employee. But no, that's not. Well, I guess it's just a wrestling business altogether. Uh, but WWF as well, right? They, they tell you uh, who you're going to wrestle, where you're going to wrestle, when to be there, 
you know, all the things you need to do, but yet you're not an employee, you're considered a 1099, an independent contractor. So you get nothing, no benefits, uh, none of that. So I, I just never understood how that worked. But yeah, those contracts were very silly. I, I was just, man, I would have signed anything. I, I would have signed my life away. I just wanted to, you know, be there and, and, and work there. But uh, looking at it later on, wow, that's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, in 1990, they were still just selling out the Sky Dome for WrestleMania six, So they were still coming down a little bit from the big wave of the 80s, but still going right. strong. Did you sign for numerous years or what was the deal? Uh, yeah, I actually, uh, uh, it, what's going on here? Sorry, sorry. Why did that come up? I don't know, I didn't touch anything. Sorry, we had a glitch on the computer. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it was a it was a three year contract, uh, but you know, again, that really didn't mean anything because, uh, again, you know, they could have just booked you ten times and then, and then you know, there was people like that, not not necessarily book them ten times, but they, you know, worked part time and only got a few bookings, and you know, once they took over, there really wasn't uh, most of the uh, smaller territories had already closed down. I think the only one left was like Tennessee or, you know, I'm not sure if they had anything left in Texas or anything. So there was no place to go to make money. So they kind of had you by the cojones, as they say. Did you ever have any weird experiences with Pat Patterson or anything like some guys? Like uh, was no, you know what? The, the only thing that ever happened to me, they, they would have, uh, and, and this was just kind of as a joke. I mean, I knew all about Pat, but he, uh, uh, I was in line to, to get food at, at a TV taping and he came from behind and tried to pull my pants down, but that was it. Not he didn't not, nothing else and and I didn't see anything else going on either. But he just laughed and I laughed it off and that was that. Yeah, that that type of stuff wouldn't go over very well today. No, probably probably not. <laughs> so you ended up taking over uh, in the Orient Express. Eventually, were you happy about that? Because you yes. were just kind yeah, of no. uh, undercard. I, I was very happy because uh, you know. I was one of those guys, you know, when I came in, uh, I didn't work all the shows. I kind of had a, a part-time schedule somewhat, maybe, you know, three quarters or whatever. And, and basically I was Paul Diamond, the guy that just put people over. So I didn't really have any kind of a position. And then I get a call and, you know, uh, Sato had, uh, uh, decided to go back to Japan and, 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 uh, uh, quit actually wrestling, but took a, a, like an agent's job over there. So they needed uh, someone to fill in. And, you know, it's funny because uh, prior to that, uh, we had a, it was a match in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And the card was, I was supposed to, I was Paul Diamond and I was supposed to work my singles match and it was the Rockers and the Orient Express. Well, uh, Sato wasn't there. And so uh, I'm not sure exactly. I guess, you know, they obviously would have been familiar with the fact that we had worked with the Rockers in the AWA. So they put me in that match and, and we, we tore the house down with those guys. I think they, that may have had, you know, something to do with the fact that uh, they uh, put me in the Orient Express. And you guys did have some matches with the Rockers in WWE, including 1991 Royal Rumble, which a lot of people still talk about today. How were those matches for you as an experience? Oh, man. Well, you know what? Any match with those guys uh, was awesome. I mean, we just we just had a, a chemistry between all four of us. We clicked. Uh, but, you know, all the, I mean, I, I respect those guys, man. Great workers. Uh, Gennetti, you know, of course, Sean, uh, Pat. So, you know, you had four guys that kind of, and, and, you know, just working with them also in the AWA, uh, we had worked together quite a bit. So uh, we really didn't have to think too much. Everybody kind of knew what the other person was going to do. So uh, it was very enjoyable. That's probably, you know, 
the the best time uh, of my career, or at least as far as an opponent. If anybody asked me, you know, who I liked working the best, I'd say those guys for sure. Mike and some other people have wanted to know. At one point, they had all three of the Orient Express members together. Was there ever any talk of keeping you guys as a faction like they had demolition with three for a while or that was just a brief gimmick yeah that was just a brief gimmick uh, you know again sato i decided uh, you know he didn't want to have anything to do with you know being on the road and full time and stuff so they just uh brought him in uh you know a few times but no I, that was never mentioned and apparently you had a big win over the Brooklyn Brawler at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. It's on your Wikipedia profile. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> apparently so. <laughs> <laughs> that I think that would have been his Max Moon. Oh, that would have been his Max Moon. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. How how did that come about with the whole you taking over Conan? I, I guess wow. he had some type of falling out and left the company. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the, the the whole story. You know, one of the things, though, that I have to sort of bring up and, and try and clarify, uh, I, I'm not much of a social media person. I, I do have uh, a bunch of, you know, followers on Facebook and stuff. I kind of read things, look at things. I'm not much to respond. I'm not much of a texter. But so every now and then, uh, you know, well, Conan was the original Max Moon. Wrong. Max Moon, well, actually, the name Max Moon never came into being until, uh, in fact, also when Conan left and I got the position to be that character, they were going to call it the Comet Kid. And, in fact, the first couple of times that uh, I put on that costume and, you know, uh, did a dark match. They called me the Comet Kid. It was not until like a month later, I show up for TV and they're giving out booking sheets and they go, Max Moon. Who the heck's that? Nobody knew. And they never even came to me and said, hey, from now on, you're Max Moon. But anyways, so back to the story. As, as far as Conan, yes, uh, you know, it, it was all Conan's idea. Uh that character actually, uh, other than than the the, the spandex costume, uh, also had this uh, helmet that had like these flashing lights, and there was like, uh, well, the, the two arm pieces, one that I kept or that Vince decided to keep that shot out flames, the other one that shot out streamers. There was also like a, a like a football shoulder pads type of thing that if you push the button like smoke came out well what was used in that was uh like fire extinguisher stuff and if you were going to go on the road with that you would have to find a place where they refilled fire extinguishers in each town and have that done so that wasn't going to work but yeah the, the whole gimmick was conan's idea well i'm not sure why or how they tried him out and, you know, he, he had the thing that he did. And I think it was Hershey, Pennsylvania uh, for the television taping. And uh, he, he just didn't show up. And uh, that day, uh, they, you know, I, I'm sure you're aware. That, so they have, they have these three sisters that uh, from Chicago. They're, they're sewing all the guys' costumes for all the different gimmicks and stuff. And... I was talking to them and, and I said to them, I said, you know, they made you rush this thing and now it's all done and you got nobody to put it on. I mean, if you made a few small alterations, eh, I could fit it. And, you know, the weird thing was that uh, across the way from them was Vince's office and, and we were kind of loud and carrying on and he opened the door and he looked out and he, he goes, well, what are you guys talking about? I said, oh, oh, nothing. I was just telling them, that, you know, about the costume and that if you made a few small alterations, I could probably fit it. He goes, ah, yeah. And, and he shuts the door. And, you know, we kept on talking and stuff. And it was probably a half hour went by. And he opens the door and, and he looks at me. He goes, you. He points at me. Go, 
whoa, what, what, what did I do? He goes, come here. Okay. I go in his office. He shuts the door. He goes, you know what you were talking about a while ago? He goes, you got it. It's yours. He puts out his hand. We shook hands and that was that. So as far as I guess there's a fan bringing up Conan kind of gets offended that you did that. You basically just jumped on an opportunity that, that came up. <laughs> Absolutely. He, he, I see that he criticized me for stealing. I didn't steal anything. I mean, he's the guy that left it. And if I was given an opportunity, what would you expect me to do? Here I was, uh, you know, at that point, Orient Express had already split up. Uh, I was actually fortunate they kept me on just to, you know, I, I was working steady, but it was, again, putting guys over as Cato and uh, somebody was going to give me an opportunity. And it's the one, it's not as if he was there and I took it from him. He just decided he didn't want to do it. So if somebody was going to do it, hell, might as well have been me. And of course, you're best remembered doing that gimmick as being on the first Monday Night Raw against <laughs> Shawn Michaels. Any memories of that? Yes, uh, a few. So, uh, you know, the, the, the Max Moon, the, the part of the costume, as I said, the, the two arm pieces, the one that shot flames and the other one shot streamers. And those things were very flimsy. They were made by guys in California, and not their fault, but they made stuff for movies, which got used once, and that was it. But I had to go on the road every day and, and use you know those things over and over, right? So uh, the night of Monday Night Raw, uh, you know, I, I'm walking to the ring, and you know, there's a cameraman maybe ten feet in front of me, and he's walking backwards. And normally, you know, I, I would raise my right arm straight up and hit the button and shoot the flames. Well, I raise my arm, I hit the button, and nothing happens. And here, you know, live TV, right? And, man, it just, I got pissed off. And so I'm going, oh, shit. What the? And as my arm is coming down and it gets straight eye level, the thing goes off. The flames hit the cameraman right in the face. He drops the camera like he had been shot dead, drops down on the ground. It like singed off some of his eyebrow, some of his beard. Uh, yeah, I, that's, I'll never forget that. And if you actually, if you go on YouTube and you watch the video, they it's from up high, the shot, but you can see as the flames come out and uh, hits the cameraman. But as far as the match, it was... Uh, you know, my pleasure to do it, and it, it was uh, it was a fun match to have with Sean. Did you get it any uh, trouble over that, or it was just no, a no? No, it was just a fluke. I mean, you know, the thing wouldn't go off, and then as my arm was coming down, man, right in between the eyes. And like I said, I thought he he shot man. He like dropped and dropped the camera, and uh, like damn. Many people on here want to know your thoughts on Mr. Fuji and his ribs and unfortunate his unfortunate passing a couple of years ago. Uh, well, you know, yeah, Fuji was a, a great river, but if you're gonna rib somebody, you gotta expect to be ribbed back, and uh, he wasn't so good at taking ribs. So, uh, you know, and, and he, he, did, he did some, you know, <laughs> I guess he thought it was funny at the time and, and, and uh, you know, but uh, yeah, no, you know, he definitely was that and, and uh, he, he would not take it. And especially, you know, the, the biggest thing with Fuji was his, his top hat, the part of his gimmick and, and uh, you know, God forbid you should ever touch that. Did you travel with him on the road? Yeah, we, you know, actually, as a part of his deal, we had to drive Fuji and he didn't have to pay uh, for any part of the rent a car. That's, that's good for him, I guess. Yeah, well, I guess. I, you know, I, I guess at the time, they, the way you know, rumors have it and stuff, but it, 
you know, they, they kept him on the road. They kept him working. He wasn't making that much money. So that was a way for them to, uh, you know, but at least I got to go to a shitload of uh, Chinese food restaurants all over the country. Screaming Baboon wants to know if you ever saw any backstage fights. Never see any backstage. You know who? Oh, man. Uh, I think not really. A, uh, the Sheik tried to kill Marty Jannetty after uh, he locked his. Uh, he, we were, I, I forget where we were at, but anyway, he got a hold of a. a, a combination lock and i think he locked his shower shoes together oh and the other thing was actually this is kind of a funny story now that you mention it um i think it might have been cleveland or something like that anyway so i had already wrestled and and i think the sheik had wrestled as well marty put on my kato costume and he snuck up on the sheik and from behind and took him down. And you know, the Sheik, he's a shooter and he was a wrestler and he, he was ready to kill Marty. But he thought it was, you know, he, at first he thought it was me and I'm like sitting right there. Uh, but yeah, it, it was it was pretty funny. Uh, it never got, you know, the boys wouldn't let it go as far as for Sheik to do anything to Marty, but that, that was one of the funniest things I've seen. The Sheik seems like the only guy that could fall for that with someone dressed up as you. Well, but you know what? He didn't pay attention. And, and you know, the Sheik, I'm not sure if his mind was quite as sharp as it should have been. If you know how, how was your time in WCW? You had a brief run there. Yeah. You know what? Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, I, again, I, I you know, like just a thought, but Pat got a job there and he got to actually work and stay there. Uh, they brought us in as a tag team. You know, it, it was fine. Uh, worked. I actually, as a tag team, I remember us working Ricky Steamboat and Arn Anderson. Uh, myself as a singles, I worked, uh, what was his name? At, uh, Johnny B. Bad, Mark Merrow. I worked Steve Austin as Stunning Steve when they were getting him ready for Muda, I think. And, and you know, had great matches with those guys. I, no reason why I at least didn't deserve a job there. But uh, Eric Bischoff was in charge at the time. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I know Eric Bischoff from the AWA di A days, right? And at that time with Vern, his job was running – actually operating the camera when we did interviews. So how he became this all knowing, all powerful guy in the WCW, I'm not sure, but uh, I realized he really didn't know a whole lot about the business because after working with Mark Merrill and having a great match, he pulled, pulled uh, Mark aside and saying, yeah, that's it. You, you had a great match. Wow. That was awesome. I don't know. I guess maybe I might have had something to do with that. Not sure. So I, I don't know how that worked out. And they yeah, had yeah. some people under contract that rarely ever worked, like Lanny Poffo under contract for three years. Well, but speaking of people who rarely work, how about you, Hannibal? I haven't seen you do anything in a while. That's right. I don't know if the cap the camera's cutting me off, but the captain is here. Yeah. There's a oh, fan that actually asked to see one of his kicks on you earlier. Oh, really? Well, tell that fan he can head over to Captain's Corner Happy Hour tomorrow with Paul Diamond. And so can you, because this interview is over. Facebook Captain's Corner. Hashtag happy hour. Arriva Dirty Dork. What? 